My name is Arnold Fischer. I'm associate professor in consumer behavior here at Wageningen University. I specialize at consumer response to new food technologies. Wageningen University is a partner in Connect for Action, a platform where consumer scientists, social scientists, and food technologists work together to improve their communication to come up with better food technology. For that reason, a toolbox has been developed, and part of that toolbox is a consumer science wiki. Why and when to involve consumer science in food technology development? As to the why of it, if you do consumer science at the right time, then you can figure out why consumers may like or not like your technology and the products coming from it. In the past, several technologies have failed because consumers didn't like it. And that, of course, has led to incredible costs and a lot of disappointment in food technology developers. If we figure out in a timely way what consumers like or dislike about a technology, we can adapt the technology and the products in such a way that the consumers will actually end up with a technology and products they like, they prefer and they would accept. So what is consumer science? Consumer science is an applied science that draws on a number of mother disciplines. It works with insights from psychology, sociology, economics and anthropology. In combining all these insights, consumer science is able to answer a whole range of questions about how consumers behave. To do so, we have to make sure that we capture the relevant substantial phenomena that consumers actually engage in. So we have to look to the real world. Besides that, we also have to bring up a strong theoretical framework. Doing so, we can use a thing called the empirical cycle, which has been uh, around for a long time. Empirical cycle says that if you want to observe and actually study something, start with observing it in a real world context. Then try to figure out some general rules, induce the structure that you've seen in the real world. From that you can then deduce predictions about how a specific setting would work. If you then test these, then you have some proof for the theories you've just developed. Of course it's important that we don't stay in the lab, and that once we've tested them, we go back to the real world and start evaluating whether the things we figured out in the theories, in the experiments, and whatever we've done to prove our theories, have actual reflection on the real world, things that consumers go through. Bringing all this together, we can come up with a relevant series of theories and studies. In these studies, a lot of things are measured. For example, we can be interested in opinions of consumers, but we may be more interested in their actual behavior. Different measures will demand a completely different way of organizing your research. There are two main types of consumer science research, qualitative and quantitative research. First I'll go into the qualitative research, a type of research that you use when you want to explore new things that you didn't expect. So it's a very open way. You explore things, you try to figure out what's going on in the mind of the consumer without imposing too much of a structure and things you already know. To do that, there are a range of methods. Semi-structured interviews, which is a way of interviewing consumers one-to-one, -one, where you talk to the consumer and make sure that you address a number of topics that you've predefined. You don't impose a rigid structure, but you make sure that all the topics are mentioned and discussed in depth before you stop. Another type of research is a focus group. In a focus group, you have a group of consumers around the table discussing a topic. That means that all kinds of social dynamics come in play. People respond to each other, supplement each other's opinions and go further on it. And this is a way to bring in some of the social dynamics that we have in real life. Yet another method is an ethnographic study. In an ethnographic study, the researcher goes along with a consumer and observes what he's doing while he or she is doing it. So that's a way of looking what people actually do when they're living their normal life. In all qualitative studies, you don't have numbers that you can easily put through statistics. You actually have what you've observed, the written out text of an interview as it happened, and with these things you'll have to analyze and figure out what it is that people meant, what they intended. That is a 
type of analysis that's very hard to automatize, which makes it very labor intensive. Also, when looking at written out interviews, it's very easy to put your own subjective meaning in what people say. So you need a highly skilled researcher to be sure that you actually figure out what people are saying rather than what the researcher thinks they're saying. And that makes it a very labor intensive type of study. Uh, because it's so labor intensive, you generally can only involve a few consumers. And that makes it very hard, if not impossible, to generalize to the larger population. Qualitative studies are exceptionally good in finding out new things you didn't accept, but to scale it up to the population, you'll need a different type of methods. There are two main types of quantitative methods that we often use. One of them is population-based surveys. In that case, we take a survey, a number of questions, where we set it out to a representative sample of the population. So the group of people we ask is similar as the population as a whole. This allows us to generalize findings and numbers to the population at large. Another big group of quantitative methods are experiments. There we bring different group of consumers into different situations. And just by creating these different situations, for example, a different product or a different context in which people have to make their decision, creates a difference in their liking, disliking of a technology. That way we can say a lot about the mechanisms in which way consumers make their decisions. Together, experiment and population service can tell you a lot about consumers. The experiments tell you why and the surveys tell you how that generalizes to the population at large. Quantitative research methods also have a few disadvantages. First of all, you have to be sure that you haven't missed important things. By asking specific questions or creating specific conditions in experiment, you exclude all other things that may be of important. Qualitative studies are much better suited there. The way you frame the questions may also result in leading, uh, leading people to give answers. Yeah, then you have invalid results. So again, you are, have to be sure that you know what you're doing when designing the study. So when you decide to do consumer science, make sure that you've sorted out a number of things before you begin. First of all, ask yourself the right questions that you really need to have answered. Then figure out the methods that will give you these answers and choose these. Of course, you have to need, have resources, so organize resources, both in money and in skilled labor, to do the research and interpret it and analyze it. Then consumer science should be able to give you good answers to your questions. I hope you enjoyed watching this brief introduction. Of course, there's much more to it, but uh, if you want more, please go to the website of Connect for Action. Thank you for watching.